Latif Mohidin is a Southeast Asian painter, sculptor and poet most well known uh, for his Pago Pago series. Latif set about on a very long journey which began in Bangkok. The idea was that he could venture further and further north all the way into what is today Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia and even into Vietnam. Through his journeys uh, he ended up realizing that there was something that connected this entire region we call Southeast Asia. Pago Pago, I sort of uh, invented the word, I coined the word uh, from Pagoda. I, I, as a Malay, we, we repeat twice. So Pagoda, Pagoda, and then become Pago Pago. So his father owns and operates a lodging house for Hajj pilgrims along 15 Java Road in, in Kampong Glam. And essentially this, this lodging house becomes a site for Latif to, to grow. And by 1953 he holds his, I mean this is, he's a, he's a kid, yeah, he says, I held my first solo exhibition. And on the walls, you see here, these are two uh, photographs. You have all these people like standing over this little boy who is painting. See, this is, this is uh, that, 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 that painting over there, the one with one coconut tree. Actually, amongst uh, literary and his, uh, historians of Kampong Glam, they have always known that Latif grew up in Kampong Glam. They just didn't know the extent to which he was connected to not just the kind of uh, physiological and geographic uh, kind of contours of the neighborhood, but also to the literary layers. And the literary layers are quite important because Kampong Glam at the time is really quite the center for the publishing industry. So he, he enrolls into Kotaraja Malay School, which is in the vicinity of Kampong Glam. And very soon his teachers recognize that there is, and this is the expression that is used in the newspapers uh, uh, at the time, that there is a gift that runs through his veins. And this gift is the ability to make pictures. So in a sense, uh, uh, we uh, kind of uh, decided that one way to bring out these complex cultural layers as Latif Mohidin experienced them was that he would produce a map. You must remember he is a very, very young boy who has not been formally trained, but he is making these works. So in a sense, he is being, he is being mentored by figures like Liu Kang, by figures like Suri Moyani, but he is not really being trained per se. So these are the two earliest surviving works from the time, which are painted in 1951 and 52. And it's quite amazing because of how he breaks down the landscape. So he says here, you break down the, the canvas into three parts. You draw a line across so the sky goes above and then the land goes under. Then you draw an M of this kind where you incorporate either the, the mountain or the thatched roof. And then thereafter he says, put in two coconut trees or one coconut tree. So he's basically breaking down a kind of a pictorial schema, right, which he then uses, and we'll come to this later in the Pago Pago works. So this, for instance, is one very early figurative work that he made titled Aku. It's, it's inspired after the, the, the poem of, of, of Kairal Anwa, uh, a poet that he would stay with for a number of years. And one thing that he learns uh, very early on, and this is in the 1950s, right? So he's, he's, when he paints this, he's 16 years old, he's 17 years old, right? And he's painting this image of this poet. And Karl Anwar is, is very much cherished uh, in the Malay world because what he does is he breaks with tradition. So he breaks with traditional Pantone systems, for instance, and he says that for the poet, for the artist to make sense in the world, he or she must also speak and write as the people do. And this is quite fantastic because 
when you look at Latif Mohideen's poetry, which there is quite a bit of, uh, as we will see, and this is something that the project also attempts to do, he really uses very straightforward, simple language. In a sense, art, this is sort of something that we'll discover throughout the Pago Pago series, and this is what I suppose makes it more powerful, is that anybody can access the image. Anybody can access the writings. So for instance, here, uh, we have uh, two fragments, uh, very early fragments, uh, so to speak. This is a, a poem that he wrote much later in the 70s, recalling um, how, for instance, you know, the light that would go through the Atap house. And when he was small, he actually had cholera. So he had to be kept in the sun as a way of treatment. So in a sense, he begins to sort of imagine this. You will notice also one thing, the, 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 the exhibition is bilingual, so it actually is in Malay and in English. And so we've actually worked very carefully with translators in order to ensure that the nuances of Latif Moedin's writings are maintained. So this one in particular, this is a translation undertaken by the poet and the amateur Saleh bin Jonet, whom uh, Latif Moedin has worked with uh, and collaborated with since the, since the early 1970s. He arrives in Berlin and it's total culture shock because there is nothing that is familiar, right? And in a sense, all his peers at the time, if you look at quite a few of the, the key Malaysian artists, his contemporaries, they'd all travel to London. So you have, for instance, your still life, you have your landscape, and then you have your figures. And so these are the three primary uh, you know, methods right, of painting that any student is taught. But you can see very early on in the imagery, the, the kind of shapes and especially the palette, because there is something in the Pago Pago image, especially in terms of the palette, which is monochromatic. This kind of, there is a kind of a flatness, and this flatness is intentional, yeah? And, and, and the other thing he realizes is control. So he arrives in Berlin and he realizes that this environment is different. But the city of Berlin is also, we must remember, this is early 1960s, it's still in ruin, yeah? And, and the city is still regenerating after the war. But Berlin opens him up to all these fantastic, fantastic influences. So he had been to these ethnological museums in Dalem, which is a kind of a vicinity, a neighborhood, I suppose, outside of the city of Berlin. And he recalls returning back to his room and making this drawing. And at the time, he titles it Pagoden, which is the German word for pagoda. But then, immediately, he begins to kind of play with the phraseology because he is really taught to think of words uh, and what words mean. And he drops the den and pago remains. And then he says pago, pago, pronounces it for rhythmic effect. But then he also begins to recall that in Minangkabau architecture, right, when you have the spired roof, Often it's always a spired roof that is most iconic. But when one looks inside, there are four sides. And these four sides actually contain shamanic carvings. And these carvings are said to protect the, those that reside inside. And in his village in Sumatra, these are described as paga paga. But colloquially, they're pronounced as pago pago. And in a sense, a kind of a medley emerges, a kind of a a synthesis between Pagodan and Paga Paga. One is not exempt right, from the socio-political uh, and cultural complexities that one finds themselves in. But perhaps if you recall my earlier expression that whilst all these things are changing, somehow Latif manages to maintain some integrity uh, as, as an individual. So in a sense, the Pago Pago is also this, this, this need, no? this, this ability of an individual to navigate through these shifting terrains, right? And still come out with something uh, to, to say. Just before we move on, um, the exhibition also contains not just Latif's poetry, but it also contains uh, what he calls uh, fragments. So Latif develops a very particular method of writing as he is moving, because the movement is generating the image. 
but the image is also generating his movement, right? So he's constantly on the move. And, and one such thing that he writes, even though it's published in 88, but he's actually writing this in the 1960s, is uh, in relation to conversations with his German colleagues. And he evokes it as, you will, you will never understand. So in a sense, he also recognizes that difference is real, right? And we cannot flatten culture to connect people. One must actually have a conversation about difference in order to connect and synthesize rather than flatten. So it's sort of grappling with very broad ranging uh, questions confronting culture uh, at, 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 at the time, at least throughout the 1960s. I think some of these questions continue to be relevant today as, as, as well. But uh, let's go into Southeast Asia proper. He has returned. He's having few exhibitions and so on and so forth. And um, he, his mother tells him, OK, Latif, you know, time to get married or do something with your life. You know, how long are you going to be an artist for? Is this really working out? Right. I mean, these are questions, right, that artists are often asked. <laughs> oh, gosh, I can only imagine how severely they were asked in the 1960s. But, and he says, uh, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to do all that. And again, he activates another idea, which is of Marantau. So Marantau amongst the Minangkabau, it is well known, literally sort of translates as migration, but, but, but Latif translates it as to seek knowledge from the world by voluntarily leaving the familiar behind. He decides to actually go north, and he goes to Bangkok. And he already knew figures like Tawan Duchani, Damrong Wong Upara, so he goes and connects with them. And he begins to actually spend significant amounts of time in Bangkok itself. And so whilst you have the pagodan and the Khmer relics, right, that he encounters in Berlin, now he's seeing the real stuff. And the image begins to really take shape and really it just kind of like, his mind kind of blows. And as he begins to sort of construct uh, the, the more formal uh, characteristics. So the image is really coming together. There's always a kind of a subterranean consciousness within the Pago Pago works. And then you have perhaps one, two, at most three Pagos, right? Constructed and placed uh, in relation to each other. He decides that he has to keep going further north. So he, he ends up in Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, crosses over into Laos, but also gets to Cambodia. And it's really when he gets to Cambodia that the, the Pago Pago image really just kind of becomes very concrete. So if Bangkok enabled a kind of a very rapid expansion in terms of the repertoire that he could draw on, Angkor really highlighted the kind of hypothesis that he's testing. And the hypothesis is this. He, he, he essentially observes that all things natural are attempting to enter and go deep into the ground. Whilst you have man-made structures, culture, I mean, he uses his word culture very loosely, is sort of attempting to reach up into the sky. But within Angkor, he notices that this tussle is in constant tension. And in this tension is an energy. And this energy, this kind of subconscious understanding of this energy, he, he evokes it through a word, a phrase. He calls it tropica. And, and this word essentially is kind of the, 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 the inner uh, uh, kind of uh, drive uh, that generates the Pago Pago image. If there was a synthesis of vocabularies that happens in Germany, here is a synthesis of forms and methods of, of thinking and working. And this is all captured actually, not just in the drawings. Uh, but also in uh, the, the, the book, I believe, of immense, immense uh, uh, literary prowess, uh, Garis, uh, Latif Mohideen, from dot to dot. It has also been translated from point to point. Uh, but essentially, this book captures it. By 1969, he realizes that the Pago Pago image is exhausted and that something new is coming. But he also realizes that in order for that to happen, he has to embark on another journey. And in 69, he receives funding to travel to New York City. 
and he travels uh, rather than just going the conventional way, he travels across the Eurasian landmass. He leaves from KL and makes his way all the way to Ireland. He transits through all sorts of places, uh, including Afghanistan. He wanted to go into Iran, but that was not possible. He runs out of time. So in a sense, um, we kind of leave the project here for, the moment, for this moment in time. And uh, he, he, he arrives in, in New York City. And uh, it's interesting the kind of uh, climatic uh, consciousness uh, that he evokes. He says, as soon as I arrived in New York, I realized that the Pago Pago image was frozen. Or it had frozen somewhere along the Eurasian landmass. <laughs>